Mr. Wad. Hey, Mr. Baldwin. How are you today? I'm good. I hope you guys are doing really well because we've got a really great segment for you. I'm Absolutely. I'm really excited about this stuff, and I love this stuff. So Good. Me too. Yeah. So fun. some of the stuff we'll be talking about is by the end of today, you should be able to explain how minerals form in a variety of ways, a couple of different ways we're going to talk about. Yeah. And then you're going to identify where those minerals are found around the world. Sounds cool to me. Good stuff to know. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's take a look at the first slide here. So we're going to talk about several different things. We'll talk about igneous processes and specifically partial melting and immiscibility. We're going to talk about hydrothermal processes, so hot water is involved in that, okay. magmatic fluids and other crustal fluids. Other two we're talking about? Uh, sedimentary processes. Uh, we'll be talking about basically making uh, different elements settle from certain solutions. Okay. And then surficial processes, so weathering of chemicals, uh, clays, we'll talk about some soils, which I love. Um, and so those are going to be like the four types that we end up talking about, right? Right. Cool. And so we've got some of those environments shown here. And uh, I think probably a good idea for you to take a couple of notes on here is we're going to talk about the igneous processes related to rift valleys and ocean ridge volcanism. So those are both divergent boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about hydrothermal processes there as well. We'll also talk about something called VMS, which we'll get to in a little bit related to convergent boundaries at island arcs and continental oceanic convergence. And then most of my processes will be up towards the more of the continental areas. So we'll be seeing our sedimentary processes and then more of the surficial processes Great. up there. Okay, let's take a look. So on the igneous processes, let's start with divergent, okay? Okay. All right, so we're going to start up in the top left corner of this slide and I'll try to stop and tell you when you're going to take notes. So we're starting with a mid-ocean ridge system here, and we know that this is a spreading center, so you might want to draw arrows showing the direction of plate movement. And we've got the magma body, of course, underneath this divergent margin. So you have a heat source here, right? Okay. Okay. And the blue up on top represents seawater, right? It would be the ocean, yeah. Yeah. So what's happening here, along with the normal faulting that happens in a rift zone, is you've got fracturing of the rock. And if the rock fractures, isn't water going to get into the rocks? The water will get into the rocks, and it's seawater that gets into the rocks. Okay. And remembering that the rocks are heated from below, okay. from that magma source. So that's where you get the heating of the water, or the hydrothermal. Okay, and seawater isn't fresh. It's got stuff in it, right? It has, it has salt and other minerals in it. Okay. That's true. So what happens is that hot water, and it is pretty hot. It can be 300 or even more than that degrees okay. C, that hot water is going to flow through those cracks and it's going to actually end up filling up the cracks with minerals and we're going to call those vein deposits. Okay. So, so they're... Go ahead. Oh, so it, it, it kind of looks like a vein because you're making a crack in it just like the mm -hmm. veins on our arms and on our body. Mm -hmm. uh, they form cracks and they fill in those veins, right? That's right. Okay. And that's where we're going to get some of the mineralization and we'll talk specifically about which ores come from that type of environment in another slide coming up. So let's move over and let's talk a little bit about the convergent plate boundary here. So a little bit different situation. We've got sediments being scraped off as the oceanic crust is subducted underneath. Okay. Now those sediments are full of water and they're also full of elements that come out of the seawater. Okay. So that's a rich source of some of the, the ore minerals that we're going to be looking for. When they get down underneath the continental block here, they're going to start to melt. Yeah, because you're increasing in pressure and temperature, so Correct. you're probably going to change around those sediments a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're going to incorporate some of them. So we're going to have little blobs, let's just call them blobs right yeah. now, of magma that are going to buoy up towards the surface because they're lower in density. Okay. And that's where we're going to find some of our ore deposits. And we've got some labels here, so you can look at copper, gold, what's SN? SN, was that, is that tin? That's tin. Okay. And W? Ooh, that one's one of my favorite German ones, tungsten. Tungsten, yeah. good, yeah. Molybdenum and gold, silver, and fluorine up there. Okay. Okay, so good sources of that at convergent plate boundaries. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, magmatic segregation. Now, when I think of segregation, I, I think of, like, splitting things apart, Separating right? Separating things, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we have the whole process kind of broken down for us into bullets of exactly what's happening inside that magma chamber. Okay. It's giving us these deposits, and we're going to call these VMS. 
volcanic massive sulfide deposits. Okay. And these are the rich deposits that we're actually mining for a lot of the things like cobalt and copper and nickel and those kinds of things. Also some very valuable things like the, the platinum group. So platinum and palladium are also coming from those VMS or volcanic so, massive sulfide deposits. So in our volcanic massive sulfide deposits, this is where to start it off, we, we partially melt some of the rock, right? Yep. Okay. That's what we're showing here. Okay, okay. so we partially melt some of it, yep. and then from there, it interacts with the rock around it. It does. Okay, because yep. it's really warm, and it's going to be changing the composition a little bit. Right. Melting some stuff, not melting some of the other things. So one of the important things that happens in that interaction is that there's a lot of sulfur in these continental rocks, mm -hmm. and that sulfur is being incorporated into the melt okay. through that heating up of the country rock, as we call it, around that magma blob. So we're separating some of that sulfur from the rock around it yes. as we melt it. Okay. Yep. Now when that sulfur gets into the magma, it doesn't mix very well. So if you think about oil and water, they don't mix together very well. The sulfur doesn't mix together very well with the silicate magma that's in that magma chamber. Just like with my salad dressing, I have to really shake it up and mm -hmm. it still it, it settles to different layers. Exactly. Okay. So what bonds to the sulfur, some things like platinum, and nickel and palladium and cobalt and copper bond with the sulfur. Mm -hmm. Now you've got these metals and sulfur bonding together and they're floating around in this mushy mass of magma. Okay. The problem is they're metals and they're pretty heavy, they're pretty dense. So what are they going to do? So if they're more dense, they got to sink they're towards the sink. bottom. Right. So then if you've got this melted magma, then the things that bond to the sulfur are going to sink to the bottom? Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty good place that you would want to get some of those metals from, right? If you can find those magma chambers, you're uh, absolutely going to get rich. Okay. Yes. We'll start looking. So let's go on to the next slide. This was that immiscibility thing you are talking about. Yes. When the sulfur wasn't really mixing with the rest of the melt, it was separating, and it was carrying with a lot of those heavy metals, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So we've got the process broken down here for you. You get the sulfur added, and again, the sulfur is coming from the rocks around the magma chamber. Because we were segregating the sulfur from the, the rock up around it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then that excess sulfur that's going to be in the melt okay. separates from the rest of the melt and pulls those really valuable metals with it, and then they sink down. So, so we have an immiscible liquid inside of the melt. So it's kind of like that sulfur that gets pulled out of the country rock, filters out all the heavy metals, the stuff we want, and has it settled to the bottom mm -hmm. almost. Okay. Yep. yep. Good. All right. So we have a little bit of a case study here for you. This okay. area should look familiar to you because here is the northern part of Wisconsin. This is like the north woods of Wisconsin. Yeah. And then uh, we've got Minnesota. And then Michigan, is that the, that's the UP Michigan. That's the where UP they, Michigan. Where the Upers live. That's it. Yeah. The edge of Lake Superior here coming down. And if you guys think back to when we talked about the New Madrid Rift, this is another rift that opened up or tried to open up the North American continent a little over a billion years ago. And didn't it try and split North America right in half? Yeah, so let's think where that rift would have been, right here. And that means that the southeast part of this would have essentially been trying to move to the Towards south and east, yeah. right? And the part that's labeled Minnesota would have been trying to move north and to the, west. the north and west. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when that happened, divergent plate boundary. We must have been having some of those veins created, right? And that partial melting. Oh, so there's got to be some good minerals up there that we would want to mine. Yeah, could be. Awesome. So what do we see here in these different colors? So this is a map that's showing us yellow, indicating that there are sandstone deposits there. Okay. Okay. The purple telling us that there's a rock called Gabbro there. Okay. Well, what's Gabbro? Now, Gabbro is an igneous rock, and that's a place where we might find some of these heavy metal ore deposits associated. Where we with could it. have those high sulfurs and kind of drain out and filter out some of those heavy metals. Good. Cool. Um, the green. These little strips here are basalt, which was probably on the ocean, the ocean new ocean floor, floor the new rift floor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then these are really interesting. The red squares, which you can see outlining the purple and labeled the Duluth complex. Right on the edge of the gabbro. That's where we have known nickel and copper mineralization. Okay. So we know there are deposits there. 
We've mined them in the past. As a matter of fact, if you talk to Mr. Z, I think he could tell you stories from this summer from going up there. Mr. Z did field camp out there, and he, he actually studied some of these rocks. Yeah. So we have some known deposits there. The black dots are kind of interesting because they're calling those favor favorable targets. What do you think that means? That's probably something where they want to go dig in there. They want to be able to figure out what's over there and hopefully make some money off of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we've got some options to go there and, and do some extractions. Sounds great. So this is kind of interesting data down here, too. We've got a nice bar graph here that shows platinum group metals on the top and then nickel, and then cobalt, and within each of those, it shows us some of the most dominant countries in terms of production. And this is where we're getting all of our metals from, too. So, like, we're getting our platinum from South Africa, Russia, and United Kingdom, mm -hmm. and our nickel from Canada, Norway, Australia, mm -hmm. and cobalt is coming from Zambia, Zaire, and Canada. Right. Wouldn't it be better if we could just get it ourselves? Well, it cut down on the transportation costs. Oh, my God, that'd be wonderful. So we need to think about those things, and there are some possible sources for us to get them domestically. Cool. Okay. All right, so we can kind of summarize some of what we talked about in divergent plate boundary mineralization with this slide. It should be really clear to see what we have here. So remember the VMS, maybe students you want to write down? What does that stand for again? That was the, oh, what was the V? Volcanic. Volcanic Massive Sulfides. Okay. Good. And things that we tend to find in volcanic massive sulfide deposits are? That was the copper, we had the cobalt and the zincs, yep. and we had the fractures and the water going into it. Yeah. And, oh, my God, so much Good, so hydrothermal deposits, right? Yep. Hydrothermal yeah. veins, good. Mm -hmm. All right. And we've got the partial melting here. And then as we come across, we have more of the rock, but we've got deposits of chromium, nickel, and platinum here. And then closer to the surface, so closer to the crust, uh -huh. things like manganese and cobalt and nickel. And is that that separation of some of those minerals that we saw, that some of those be. elements? Yep. Okay. Okay, so that's a good review of what happens at divergent mar margins. Okay, so now we got to talk then probably about uh, what we would see there. Yeah. Okay, so okay. some of the rocks. And is this an actual rock that we would find at the place? This is an actual picture of a rock that comes from a VMS Scrape. Yeah. Okay. So they're actually using submersibles now to dive and look for deposits that they can mine on the ocean floor. Like that Elvin sub we saw earlier in the year. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we'll come back to, to deep sea mining later on in another segment. Cool. But let's go forward with this one. Okay, so these are where we actually see some hydrothermal vents that are being created right now, right? Yeah. So like we're familiar with, we got the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Yep. and if we look at the dots, the dots show some of the places. Are we actually mining some of these? We're not, but we no? know that there are deposits there. Oh, so we could mine those at some point. We could. Maybe. If we can find a way to do it economically. That'd be great, yeah. yeah. Some of the other places along the East Pacific Rise, so mm -hmm. another divergent plate margin here. Right around at the uh, Juan de Fuca plate Very up good. in uh, was, uh, Washington, so uh -huh. we definitely have some up there. Yep. Okay. And then over here in the South China Sea and off the Marianas Trench, here in the Philippines, we have some more deposits. Okay. And I think later on we're going to talk maybe a little bit about the rare earth deposits that we're finding out there as well. So, good source of information on hydrothermal vents. Okay, so now we're looking at continents. We're not looking at the divergent, we're not looking at the convergent, we're looking at some of the continents. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, these are found on the crust, and this shows some of the igneous rocks related with those continents, aren't they? Right, so convergent plate part right oh, here. Oh, sorry, right? yeah. Convergent. So we've got the ocean crust being subducted underneath this continental crust. And we're seeing some of the, the results of that volcanism there. So copper, molybdenum, lead, and zinc mm -hmm. forming there. Tin and tungsten mm -hmm. here. And then we've got some really special circumstances called kimberlite pipes. And that's which where we're are getting those diamonds, right? Bringing up diamonds. Cool. But notice that this is much deeper source oh my gosh, than any comes, of the, the, these others. That comes from the asthenosphere, all the way down one before we were only getting part of the lithosphere. Right. Wow. So we know that diamonds form only under very, very high pressures, mm -hmm. and that's where those are coming from. Okay. We'll talk about those individually at another point. And then we have some other deposits over here that are associated with some of this tectonic activity. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right, good. Okay, so now we're talking about some of the sedimentary processes, okay? So what we're looking at is we're looking at concentrating 
different deposits of sand and gravel. And really what we're looking at is ancient stream beds. Yeah. So when I think of going to the river or a stream, I always think about getting sand between my toes, getting some rocks and pebbles, skipping stones. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great place to find sand and gravel, an old stream bed. Yeah, but think about the gold rush and mm -hmm. when they were doing panning for gold. Oh. So they were actually trying to take advantage of what placer deposits are that we're mining in different places around the world right now. Okay, because isn't there gold in some of those deposits and we can kind of wash some of it off the gravel and everything? Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. Okay. So here you can see some examples. Oh, let's go back one second. Here you can see some examples of a gold ore, and you can actually see the little flecks of gold in this. And then here you see what a placer deposit looks like if they're actually going in to look at it. And we've got a shovel here for scale. So you mm -hmm. can see some of the bigger pieces concentrated here, and you might be able to extract one of those and be lucky enough to find some flecks of gold in it. Okay, so now we're talking about little soils, aren't we? Yeah. Okay, so we've got these soils called laterites, okay? And what they are, they're rich in iron and aluminum, a little bit of nickel. And what's happening really is the really weathered soil. So they've been around for a while, and you wash a lot of water through it. And as you wash a lot of water through it, you wash a lot of the lighter stuff away. Okay. So you're left with some of the heavy stuff, right? Okay. Okay. And actually what happens is if you get a little bit of... Um, like a little acidic, a little acid that goes through it, you actually speed that up a little bit and you can dissolve some of those minerals. Okay. And so if you wash away all the stuff you don't want, you're left with... The minerals that you do want. The minerals you do want. Okay. So, so it's we, concentrating them that way. Yeah, just right. like the concentrations we saw earlier in the processes. Okay. So I think students <coughs> probably want to circle a couple of things here. First of all, um, on the third bullet, you see that word leaching? So leaching is actually what Mr. Baldwin was just talking about, about large amounts of water, maybe in a tropical rainforest kind of environment where mm -hmm. there is a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. And leaching would be lots of rainwater soaking through the soil, and because it's slightly acidic, mm -hmm. dissolving some of the minerals that are in the soil and carrying them away and concentrating them in lower levels. Gotcha, and washing them away, putting them somewhere else. So segregating those things mm -hmm. you want and getting rid of the stuff that you do want, or that you don't want. So that's the process of, of leaching and then concentrating them later. Gotcha. Great, okay. <clears throat> And then this is the one we have to talk about, Mr. Z. I mean, he went over here this summer. Yeah. It sounded like he had a really good time. But these are banded iron formations, and it's another sedimentary deposit. And it happened about 2.5 to 1.8 billion years ago. Okay. Only and happened then. There were some really different concentrations of gases in the atmosphere at that point, and I think that's probably what was happening, right? Yeah, we didn't have oxygen in the atmosphere at that point. Is that right? That's what I hear. Okay. It would have been hard to breathe. Yeah, and so what actually happened was we actually had a lot of iron that settled towards the bottom of the ocean, and that iron actually settled, and some of it got oxidized, some of it was reduced. So that's where you get different, uh, I was going to say flavor, different colored irons uh, that are present at the bottom of the ocean. And it was those cyanobacteria, or we call them blue-green bacteria, mm -hmm. that were actually responsible for giving off a lot of the oxygen uh -huh. that we think concentrated oxygen in our atmosphere to mm -hmm. make the atmosphere that we have today. Yeah. So part of the banded iron formation formation process is mm -hmm. what's responsible for giving us our oxygen-rich atmosphere oh, that cool. we have. Yeah. But it also gives us these great sources to go in and mine for iron, which we, of course, use in. We can use it for, like, steel production. Yeah. We make cars out of it. We get all kinds of really neat heavy metal, or heavy, like, steel, iron, anything that we use for metal, really. Right. Good. Okay. You ready for a mastery check? Let's do this. I'm ready okay. to do this. If you go to your class website, there's going to be a quiz waiting for you. You can go back to the video even and listen to some of the things we said to help you out on the quiz. We're shooting for 100% on these. Or go back to the slide deck separately, either way. Perfect. Good luck. Have a good night, guys. See you in class.